Well, hello, CAM followers. This is a recording. We had some technical issues, but we will never give up. We will still get that content out to you. So please welcome the lovely Karen Perry. She is here all the way from the US to talk to us about catching the signs of arthritis early because this is important. It's a welfare concern. And what, rather than us waiting for the signs, are there ways that we can actually catch this disease earlier and do a lot more about it? Karen, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you <clears throat> and then we can crack on. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm uh, Karen Perry. I'm a, currently an associate professor at Michigan State University. So as uh, Hannah said, all the way over in the, in the United States. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, the Pat Carrigan Professor of Feline Medicine. So that doesn't mean I only treat cats, but it just means I have a special interest in cats and obviously they got arthritis too. So um, that's, uh, it's all relevant to what we're talking about today and particularly relevant for that early diagnosis section. So um, as you probably tell from the accent, I'm not originally from America. Um, so I was originally over in the UK. I did all my vet school training. Um, at Edinburgh, I did my residency training as a, a small animal surgeon at Edinburgh University as well. Um, then went down to work at the Royal Veterinary College for four years as an orthopedic surgeon um, before moving over to Michigan State, where I've been since 2015. So I've um, been here for quite some time. Uh, oh, a while now. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, it goes so quick. But, um, but yeah, that's my kind of little potted history. I guess. Put it like this, every time that Karen writes anything, it's like gold dust. I can remember meeting you, not that you knew that I met you, but reading your Vet Times articles. <laughs> You've done quite a few series of articles where there is just so much to say about this disease. You're like part one, part two, part three, part four. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so she really, really is going to be giving us some real good gold dust stuff tonight. We're gonna try and tackle, as I say, the welfare aspect. At the moment, I would think it's fair to say that we catch this disease late. We're very reactive to it. And the figures of 50% of dogs are not being diagnosed until they're between eight and 13 years old really kind of shouts, well, what happened before that? Could we have done more? So the idea tonight is to really teach you guys what the underlying causes, drivers of arthritis are, to then make you think, well, hmm, does that apply to me? And should I be more vigilant? Should I be getting health checks that are more focused and targeted to joint range of motion, et cetera? So lead the way, Karen. What is in dogs, because we'll talk about cats later, the <laughs> believed leading cause of arthritis? Um, well, I don't know there's, there's one leading cause, but I think the main thing is, as you're saying, is that the vast majority of dogs that do have osteoarthritis do have an underlying cause. And so I, I guess if we're talking about hind limb osteoarthritis, then um, some of the major contributing factors are going to be hip dysplasia, um, which obviously we should be able to diagnose at a really young age. Um, we have a cranial cruciate ligament disease, which is a major contributor to osteoarthritis. We have all of the osteochondrosis conditions which um, can affect um, the stifle or the knee and the hock or ankle as well. Um, and, and then on top of that, we have all, all of the kind of traumatic injuries as well. Um, then for limb, um, the big contributor is going to be our elbow dysplasia, obviously whole umbrella terms are a huge number of conditions that come under that. Um, the osteochondrosis, again, primarily affecting the shoulder and, and then the elbow as well. Um, and, and then again, that, that subset of traumatic conditions. And I think something that we see a lot is, is people who are a little nervous to actually say the dog is definitely like has arthritis. You know, we, we see all these things. The dog might develop arthritis secondary to this condition. No, no, no. <laughs> as soon as the dog has one of those conditions, they have osteoarthritis. It doesn't matter that the dog is six months old, seven months old, eight months old. If they have one of those conditions, they already have osteoarthritis. If they have a traumatic joint injury, they already have osteoarthritis. And so waiting for it to be evident on an X-ray or on a CT scan is not doing these animals any favors and kind of being shy about saying to people, I'm really sorry, I know it's devastating, but your animal does have osteoarthritis and it has it now. So we start managing it now, not when the X-ray looks ugly in three years time. So I think people are nervous about saying, this dog has arthritis and so we get this fluffy it might develop and we know if they've got these conditions they have arthritis right from the word go yeah i think um i can relate to that massively in that when i was a new grad 
you have a lameness, you localize it to a joint, which you're pretty proud about, and then you get on and do your orthogonal view x-rays and you, you don't see arthritic change, the osteophytes, the bony changes. And then you go in on yourself and go, well, what happens if it's not? Where else could it be? And I know, I know that I've referred cases because I'm like, well, I don't know what it else could be. And I think, as you say, we really hang on to wanting this visual confirmation on an x-ray, but it, we've got to do more than that, haven't we? We've got other ways that we can actually go, yes, this is an arthritic joint. A, because we know that any trauma causes inflammation in the joint and that sets up the arthritis. But also we, we need to trust our hands more. We need to trust our observations more, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we know that with osteoarthritis, the first changes that we're going to see is inflammation in the synovial fluid and changes to the articular cartilage. They don't show up on an x-ray. They don't even show up on a CT. Or they, you know, really in small animals, they don't really show up on an MRI either. So, you know, the, you know, it's not all about imaging. It's we have to be a little bit um, again, like you say, trust your orthopedic exam, um, maybe take fluid samples from the from the joints if you really want to kind of see, find those early changes, consider potentially an arthroscopy to look for the cartilage changes. Um, and these things are becoming more and more doable with the um, the mini scopes that are becoming available, you know, needle scopes that we can potentially do arthroscopy on an outpatient basis um, in the same way that your dog comes in for an appointment and we do a sedation and take x-rays. Now you can do a sedation and put a little mini scope in and actually look at the cartilage within the joint. So um, we're getting better. Um, but there's certainly still a way to go. And obviously, uh, you know, potentially looking at um, genetic testing and, and lots of other things that are coming online in the future. Um, but right now we still have better tools at our fingertips that I think we just need to make more readily available. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm going to take a little tangent just to try and get people to understand why early diagnosis is important. And then we're going to come back to ways to diagnose early. <laughs> so we're just going to do a little scoot. And the reason being... Is I know there's a lot of people out there that go, oh, well, they get arthritis. That's what they get. You can't change it. That's what it is. Accept it. Why are you bleating on? You can't change the inevitable. But when you actually look at what this disease does and having a slight possibility of effect in its progression, it's hugely important. So can you talk about the changes that happen in the joints, the changes that happen in the nervous system, the changes that happen to the dog's mood? Mm -hmm. and think etc so people can go oh god i don't want my dog to get in that so <laughs> we can all agree early diagnosis is worth fighting for and it is hard work and you do see the pound signs go past and you're like is he lame and you're seeing pound signs going past do i really need to do this work up tell them about the progression yeah yeah absolutely so i think um osteoarthritis is characterized by that progressive degradation, I guess, and, and loss of that articular cartilage within the joint. And that's the hallmark that everyone always talks about. Um, and that can be related to altered kind of um, metabolism and the mechanisms of repair of, of, the, the, of the articular structures, if you like. Um, and it's also um, involving all of the other structures within the joint as well. So we have to remember it's affecting the synovium or the, the capsule that surrounds the entire joint. It's affecting the bone underneath the cartilage, which we term the subchondral bone. Um, and in joints that have menisci, such as the, the, the stifle and the temporomandibular joint, it's going to involve those other structures as well. So when we talk about osteoarthritis when it is a well-established disease, um, that means that that progressive degradation we're talking about affecting all of those structures is already really well underway. Um, and loss of the articular cartilage being a really significant problem because once that occurs, it's irreversible. I cannot ever give your dog back articular cartilage if it's gone. Um, so that's something that we really need to try and, and avoid. Yeah. Um, so, but I think when we get to that well-established disease, we've progressed well beyond that point. Um, we have like all of those structures are affected. We have inflammation of the synovium, we have inflammation of all the ligaments surrounding the joint as well. We have inflammation of the lining of the bone, the periosteum, um, and the actual bone underneath the cartilage too. And then you start to develop micro fractures, so little cracks in the bone underneath, mm -hmm. um, and little cysts in that area too. Um, and areas of bone can completely lose their blood supply and start to die off. And that's incredibly painful process. So all of these things are happening as that disease progresses over time. And, and that becomes more and more difficult to control pain relief wise, because 
I think one of the reasons for me that we really struggle to control osteoarthritis related pain is because pain that's coming from the subchondral bone is going to respond to a different analgesic than pain that's coming from a ligament that's surrounding the joint. A ligament is going to be affected by the activity the dog has done that day. If it's got little micro fractures in the bone, that's also going to be affected by exercise. So you're not looking at a static target. It's an ever moving target that you're trying to do. And we talk a lot about the variation between dogs with osteoarthritis, but maybe less about the fact that the individual dog's pain is changing over time throughout one day. And so the medication you give in the morning might not be effective in the afternoon after they've exercised and vice versa. Um, and it certainly isn't going to be effective for all of those different tissues. So I think all of those things are things that we're really struggling to, to deal with. And it's why just handing a dog a, a course of tablets and expecting them to be good like day in, day out is never going to be effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you explain to them about like the nervous system? Because I think um, for me, when I started getting a little bit fascinated about it, that was a that was a real kick in the face. You know, you're like, holy moly, I've never really thought about it like that. Because you imagine that the nervous system is a little bit static. It doesn't really change much. What, you, what you're born with is what you've got. Mm -hmm. But when you start realizing what's happening within the nervous system, I think it really spurs you on to get in and medicate and act quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So when, when we think about that, that major outcome of osteoarthritis, like what's happening, we get this very complex pain state and it's contributed to from lots of different things. So we have what's commonly termed as nociceptive pain, which is the pain that's coming directly from the damaged joint. And then we have what's called neuropathic pain, which occurs secondary to the fact that you've got chronic pain input over time. This has been going on for a long, long time um, into that central nervous system. Um, and that nervous system can adapt over time. It gets called what we call, refer to as plastic. So it can adapt over time to that chronic pain that's coming in. Um, and what we get is the development of something called central sensitization. So something that wasn't painful two months ago now is perceived by the dog as being quite substantially painful. Mm. Um, and you just get a general ad adaptation of the nervous system to this chronic pain that's coming in. Mm. Now, that nociceptive pain that's coming from the joint itself, that contributes to just a gradual deterioration of our musculoskeletal system. So you see decreased mobility um, and all that kind of thing. And so muscle atrophy, all those things are, are kind of affecting us. Um, but in well-established disease, when it's been going on for a long time, those changes to the neurological system are what are going to contribute to the perception of pain for that particular animal. Um, and the effects of that pain and that central sensitization um, and activity impairment secondary to that can have really negative effects on the affective state of that animal. Now, we have less information in, in dogs because it is more difficult. But if you look in people, um, it has it, it heightens anxiety. It causes depression. It causes sleep impairment. It causes cognitive dysfunction. All of those have been reported in humans secondary to neuropathic pain from osteoarthritis. Mm. Um, and not only that, if that's not bad enough in itself, the neuropathic pain is incredibly challenging and time consuming to manage. Um, it's going to necessitate different medication protocols. Um, as we said, with all arthritis plans, we want them tailored to the individual patient, but that becomes much more difficult with that neuropathic pain. Um, and this pain can become so severe that we end up thinking about kind of total joint replacement, things like that, because we, the medications just aren't really working for us. No, and then that's a whole topic, isn't it? I um I was at a conference recently where we we don't know about um, joint surgeries whether they're left with post-operative pain, do we? That's a whole topic that's going to blossom at some <laughs> point. Absolutely, and obviously, you know, you're replacing one joint. The, the, the likelihood is the dog has arthritis in multiple so you're still not addressing all of that problem you're addressing part of the dog's problem but you know the the soft tissues we mentioned we're not replacing the soft tissues when we replace the joint the soft tissues are still there they're still not normal so um all of those things have to be taken into consideration for sure definitely and then now because i'm hanging out a little bit more with the the behaviorists <laughs> i i realize once you get an established behavior, how difficult that is to resolve. So we're focusing this um, 2023 is definitely going to be a year about pain and behavior. We can feel it. You know, the big drug companies are really um, focusing down on it because we're now getting data about arthritis being a young dog disease. How do we detect it in young dogs? Well, behavior change is going to be a big component of this. Absolutely. But once you've got a learned behavior, when it's become established and definitely if it's an unwanted behavior, such as aggression, dog on dog aggression, dog to human aggression, 
anxiety, all of these things, once they're established, they are really hard to reverse. So you've got a, a huge impact on quality of life and their integration into the family. Mm-hmm. And it's a common thing as a first opinion practitioner when you see an owner come in and they say, well, we've kind of lost faith in him because he started, you know, he bites us now when we pick him up. And you're like, well, well, I've got a lot of work. I've got the joint disease, the nervous system, cognitive change, learned behaviours, bit of a project. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I think that's I think I think we've suitably scared them. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've suitably, you know, framed it of we would rather not go there. Oh yeah. Yes. But now we've got a big problem, and I'm going to be outrageous. If you do catch it early what do you do about it and this is something that's lacking I think in vet education if I'm really honest and I've had a number of vets say to me well great I've picked it up early what do you want me to do about it because (laughs) I actually only know how to manage terminal palliative care end stage joint disease what do we do with early OA and I'm going to probably do a case so that we can follow it a bit more Mm -hmm. so we've got a golden retriever eight months old waistline wiggle being just a little bit slow on exercise chooses to lay down after running and you say hmm there's something going on here you examine the dog um you've got autolani so those hips are lax but there's no actual radiographic changes or suggestive osteophytes and all the morgan's line and all this sort of stuff but you've got lax hips and you've got a dog showing you signs of pain what sort of things in that situation do you talk to your owners about? Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting kind of just the way you presented that case also just brings up some points as well, is that how often do you have a case that comes to you? We get so many cases referred. It has osteoarthritis. Yes, but why? What is the underlying condition? And is that actually confirmed? And so I think the first thing that I would adv- like advocate for your pet If your pet has been diagnosed with osteoarthritis, um, you should be immediately wanting to know what the underlying cause for that condition is, particularly if we're talking about a young dog um, and we want to have a kind of really a solid diagnosis. And the way you presented that case, we have that solid diagnosis um, and we have all the information we need, but quite frequently see people trying to build treatment plans without that solid diagnosis. And I think that's always going to be less rewarding for the vet and for the the patient and the owner. So um, starting off with that solid diagnosis is going to be absolutely critical. Um, for, for those cases with, with, um, with hip dysplasia that are showing obvious clinical signs, I think there's a couple of um, aspects of the disease that need to be considered because I think some people are getting very, very surgery happy with these cases. Um, and I think it's important to remember that yes, we have osteoarthritis. We know this dog has hip dysplasia, regardless of what the x-ray says, osteoarthritis is already there. Osteoarthritis will progress over time how much it will affect the dog clinically, we don't know. Mm. We see dogs with horrendous hip x-rays at age eight that are running around doing absolutely fine. And we'll see dogs with radiographs that are barely abnormal, that are really, really struggling. So I think all of these things are are things that we need to be honest with owners that we just don't know yet. Mm. Um, But hip dysplasia and the associated pain does tend to be what we call a bimodal condition. So we see two ages that these dogs come in to see us. And we do quite frequently see them come in at this eight to nine months kind of mark, sometimes a little earlier than that, with profound signs of pain, exactly like like you're describing and not wanting to exercise, not being able to be the puppy they want to be. Um, And then those signs will often actually, if they're managed appropriately, will often go over time and then not come back for several years. So kind of jumping in with kind of surgical options at this stage makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I don't know if this dog's going to be clinical long term or whether it's just having a couple of months of a bad time Mm. regardless I think at this stage we don't have any radiographic change we know we have an underlying condition um, and in these cases I chat to owners about all of the different options say look surgery might be an option in the future but right now let's think about the the risk factor for arthritis that your dog has and let's think about what we can do for that and so the risk risk factor is this dog has loose hips Um, so I'm going to get this dog into physical rehabilitation as a kind of as an absolute priority. Um, I'm not saying that can cure the dog of hip dysplasia, but if I can have the dog well muscled, then it may be able to cope better with its condition. Um, Its hips may move around less, less inflammation, hopefully less progression of osteoarthritis. So um, physical rehabilitation for me is going to be key for those cases. 
Um, now, a lot of people are kind of wary of drugs at this early stage. And I, but however, I would say physical rehabilitation, if you're doing it well, is often a painful process. And so I would probably be prescribing some medication for this patient. It's already showing us signs of pain. It doesn't want to exercise and it's a puppy. And I think puppies have a huge psychological drive to run and play. So if they're not playing, they're really quite sore. <laughs> That's my, my kind of like theory of things anyway. Um, so I would probably would be um, advising some routine blood work for screening and then some anti-inflammatories there. Um, and then having a really serious discussion about um, weight management, uh, potentially some nutritional management in there as well. Um, and um, obviously the discussion about um, not breeding from, from, this, from this patient as well. And potentially if you have contact with other litter mates, maybe letting them know that um, they might be at risk and potentially want to get screened as well. Perfect. So there would be a real tendency at that point for people to start talking about nutraceuticals with the joint health promotion. We've talked about this before, so I don't know the answer, but I'm priming for you to just pull your string and let go. Um, <laughs> there, I know as a vet, a first opinion vet who's trying to manage early OA in a young dog, that's going to be something that they feel drawn to do because it's it's something to do. It's something to really latch on to. It feels that you're doing good because you're putting good into the body and it's going to improve joint health. Do we know that? No, we absolutely don't. And um, there's been several attempts to try and prove that nutraceuticals, and I'm just going to bump them all together because there's a huge number of them, but we're talking about the glucosamine, chondroitin, shark fin, green lip muscle extract, all, all the different things, you know, they, I'm, I'm talking about them all as an umbrella term here, but there's been a lot of efforts and some and some fairly high caliber research that's been done trying to prove that these are effective both in the human field and in the veterinary field. And unfortunately, we have no study at all that shows that these have any clinically relevant effect for our patients. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they're not doing something very, very tiny in the background. Maybe they are reducing inflammation a little bit. Maybe they are doing something, but it's not capturable. We can't actually show that these dogs or cats improve on these medications, on these, on these supplements. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, I, I have a very, very strong feeling about this in that I would not advise anyone to take something or to give their dog something that I personally wouldn't give my own pet. And I have to say, if my pet had osteoarthritis, I would not be reaching for nutraceuticals. I'd be spending my money on something that has evidence behind it. Um, so for me, nutraceuticals are not something I would use. They're certainly not something I encourage owners to use. Now, if they've tried them or if they're if money is no object and, you know, they want to try them, they're certainly not going to do any harm. So we don't have evidence they do good. We certainly have no evidence they do harm either. So. If you want to try them, then there's absolutely no reason not to other than financial. Um, and so you yeah, absolutely try them. I think if you want to try them, I would advocate for having some kind of objective measurement rather than just you looking at your pet. So maybe have it come back and have another exam or stand on a pressure mat or go over a force plate or something you can actually say for sure, maybe using one of the, the questionnaires that have been validated, but do something more objective than just looking at your pet. Now, if after 12 weeks on the on the on the nutraceutical, you think absolutely on this questionnaire, my dog's doing better. Great. Then by all means, continue it. Mm -hmm. um, if the questionnaire says your dog is no better, then I would say save your money. But, but it's, it's still even harder, isn't it? Because you said it's by modal and people will start the nutraceutical when their eight month old golden retriever is showing signs. And then the dog will start to improve their <laughs> clinical signs. The person will be going, well, I don't know. Is it the supplement or is it going to get better anyway? It's kind of a win-win for, for the nutraceutical companies in many ways, isn't it? It is. And, and I'm surprised, I have to say, by how many people are very, very supportive of nutraceutical use because the evidence base to me is just so lacking. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not cheap. Uh, if you've got a large breed dog on these things, they're pretty expensive, most of them. So um, I, I just think it's, a, it's, a, it's very difficult to justify. And so it's not something that I personally ever really mention to owners unless they bring it up. Because I kind of feel as a vet, when you mention something, people feel emotionally kind of, was that, well, I should do it because the vet mentioned it. We have a huge almost power in that respect to influence people to do things and so to me nutraceuticals is not something I mentioned if my residents put it in the discharge form I delete it um, it's it's something that I'm just gonna <laughs> so I don't put it on any of the paperwork I don't advise it if an owner asks me the question about it then absolutely I'll tell them my thoughts on it and and let them 
trial it if that's something they want to do but it's not something I really bring up as as a as a valid part of an osteoarthritis plan because I just don't have the evidence to say that it works no and it is it is such a it's a minefield it really is it's the topic that comes up the most in camp all the time and it's no one's fault because owners at this stage at any stage feel vulnerable and they will want to do anything and the exchanging of hard-earned money for a pill or a potion that offers promise is natural people just do fall for it something to just kind of hammer home now because i hear this quite a lot when they have these nutraceuticals on board and they're they believe that they're influencing the OA progression and then they continue to throw the ball. So like the nutraceutical almost cuts out the impact torsional forces. And I'm like, going, it's not like a Harry Potter cloak of health. It doesn't suddenly protect those joints from harm. They do not negate each other. So right. Yeah. Take- and I would say like evidence-based wise, again, we don't, you know, We don't have a huge amount of evidence on exercise or environment or the impact of all of these things either, but that doesn't really cost you anything. So I would definitely be doing the avoiding slippery floors. I would be modifying my dog's activity level, um, all of those kind of things way before I'd be reaching for for a nutraceutical. it's, it's, It's just, to me, if something doesn't have evidence, asking someone to exchange money for it is... I'm as far as criminal but it's ethically dubious in my opinion <laughs> yeah no it is it's really um I have to just drop this in because so we were at the VOA conference and the lovely Jamie McClement who I believe is my brother from another mother he was taking the mickey about my um my dislike for ball throwing and he was like I don't believe that ball throwing is that bad in all occasions and I was like hmm We'll agree to disagree on this and then there's a paper out from the canadian team that have come mm-hmm. up with a treatment protocols post yeah. post they mentioned ball throwing and i was like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but there is as i say you're right there's not very much evidence so you have to translate a lot from human work but there's a, a bit of evidence-based logic behind it isn't there in terms of the ball throwing or in terms, so in terms of in terms of ball throwing and trauma when we know that one of the things that influences OA development is joint trauma so oh that, I mean there, there is evidence it's just it, you have to extrapolate there's there's some actually some fairly good evidence um from from pigs um showing the the effects of environment in in the joints and different floor surfaces and and different activity levels and things so there is some evidence out there it's just you have to extrapolate it from other places um, and certainly um, there are some really good, uh, and I think some uh, research that's coming out, I saw the abstract presented recently at, at a 1AO conference, but looking at um, cruciate ligament injuries and re-injuries in adolescents in high school. Um, and um, and definitely some parallels to be drawn there, because I think like you know, our, our kind of canine population and when they're developing arthritis is very similar to that high school athlete kind of yeah. uh, population in, in some ways. So um, I think certainly there is some there's some evidence there and they were showing that activity levels certainly had a huge impact on re-injury rate and prognosis, things like that. So yeah. Yeah, good. I'm glad. I'm, it's I coming. Just, um, <laughs> and I think that you hit the nail on the head for me in that I was from a family that had the beloved Labrador. You know, we had Lancer and then we had Bruno. We didn't have a lot of money. We really didn't. My dad brought four kids up on quite a low wage, being a self-employed builder. Didn't mean that we didn't love that dog to bits, but we would have never have been able to spend, you know, 80 pounds a month on a supplement. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to afford x-rays because he wasn't insured. But there was still a hell of a lot of things that we could do for him. And I think that's what really drives Cam is there is a lot of stuff that you guys can do with you know your own observational skills your own physical activity weight control lifestyle all of that has a huge impact but it's just trying to get that information across to people isn't it yeah I, and what's interesting as well is that if you go as, as, a, as a human you go to the doctor they, that's immediately what they tell you all these things like you must lose weight you must exercise you must do all these things and it's, kind of, it's, it's and then and yet somehow when it comes to our pets it doesn't translate um so it must be something to do with the way maybe, maybe we can communicate these things better or like, like you say have get better evidence to back it up things like that but um it's interesting that, that all of the things that we would probably just do ourselves if we have an injury we would automatically do for ourselves somehow we don't translate that across to our to our to our to our pets you know like 
if we've got a recurrent injury and we're going out running, we'll stretch before we go, we'll warm up, we'll do all these kind of things. Like how many people do you see warming up their dog before they go for a run? They just don't, we just don't do it. And maybe your two or three year old dog copes with that fine, but your 10 year old dog going for a few mile run would probably appreciate a warm up and a cool down. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> like the logical stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Just because I want to try and keep us um, still testing the boundaries of recognize it early, there isn't suddenly a ravine of nothing to do. So I'm going to throw another case at you. So we've got we've got an owner, and um, they've always wanted a Rottweiler, always wanted a Rottweiler, um, and that's been more important to them than actually looking at any kind of like breed predispositions, etc. The dog gets to around about ten months old, and she's just every now and then noticed a little bit of stiffness in the forelimb. She can't point, remember which leg. Could be that one, could be that one, not sure. And she then um, has a chat with somebody in the park and they said, oh, you don't know that Rottweilers are predisposed to elbow problems. And she goes on to the OFA, she realises Rottweilers and she sits there and she's like, oh my goodness me. And she goes to a vet, what would you like to happen in that case? How would you like it to play? I've got a young dog, it's, it's subtle, she's not quite sure what could be that dog's future. Um, I mean, I think I think the first conversation to, to have with owners, if they come in and you're suspecting an elbow problem, is that the elbow is the most complex joint that we deal with. And it's unfortunately the least rewarding joint that we deal with as well. Um, so I think establishing um, realistic expectations right from up front is, is important. And that goes right from these conditions are difficult to diagnose, particularly in the younger dogs, um, and that they're difficult to manage and that our evidence base behind what to do is pretty poor. Um, that the reason there's 50 different options for treating disease of the elbow is because none of them are actually proven to be particularly great. Um, and that even when we think about our final salvage option in terms of joint replacement, yes, we have a joint replacement option for the elbow, um, but it's nowhere near as, um, you know, well, well, I think, let's say, the complication rate associated with, with it is a lot higher and there's still work to be done in terms of optimizing that joint replacement. So it's nowhere near as um, successful as total joint replacement for the hip, for example, would be. Mm -hmm. So establishing good expectations, first thing. Um, now, again, a, a lot of where we're going to take these things is going to be dependent on what the owner wants to do with that dog. What, what are the owner's expectations for that dog um, and how much are they wanting to spend for this dog? Mm. Because this can start running into thousands and thousands of pounds pretty quickly. And as we talked about a little bit with nutraceuticals, I've got no problem telling someone a hip replacement is going to cost you seven to $8,000 because the chances are your dog is going to do very well with that hip replacement. This becomes a lot more difficult when you're saying, I want you to spend five to $6,000 for me to uh, take diseased bone out of both of your dog's elbows and your dog might do exactly the same afterwards. It might do slightly better afterwards. It might do great and it might get worse afterwards. And um, any of those things could happen and the arthritis will progress regardless of what I do. Mm. So that conversation starts to be a lot more difficult. So again, I, what I like to do if owners are kind of open to it and if they have the financial wherewithal to go forward, again, the first thing I want to do is try and get a definitive diagnosis. Um, and for me, um, especially in the young dogs, um, I tend to go to a CT scan rather than going for radiographs because we know that I'm going to be able to pick up about you know, over 90% of elbow dysplasia conditions on a CT scan and get a definitive diagnosis for them. It's not 100%, but it's it's the closest we have for a non-invasive invasive treatment op, uh, diagnostic option. Um, and radiographs will tell me there's something abnormal, but we're not quite sure what in a lot of these cases. So I tend to go for CT um, in the first instance and try and establish that definitive diagnosis. Once we have that diagnosis, then we can have a bit more of an informed discussion about what the treatment options are. With your clinical examination, so say you, you don't have access to CT and the owner hasn't got the financial access to a CT, how much, how reliable do you think at the clinical exam, the range of motion, you know, putting stresses through that elbow is accurate? You know, can we rely on it? I think I think you can rely on it for diagnosing that the dog has an elbow. You know, some people will say, well, if you press directly over the medial coronoid process, then, um, you know, and the dog is painful, then maybe it's more likely to be medial coronoid disease. 
Okay, I would also say to you, if you press hard enough over anybody's coronoid process, they're probably going to respond to it. So um, it, it's like, how hard are you pressing? How accustomed are you to doing that part of your exam? Is it the same on the other side? Well, that's not really that meaningful because it might be bilateral. Um, in fact, 70% of cases or more are. So um, I don't, I would, I would say you can have a suspicion based on your exam, which elbow dysplasia condition you might be dealing with, but I wouldn't write home about it and say definitively this is what it has. So you can say the elbow is thickened, the elbow is effused, the elbow is painful on flexion extension, there's crepitus, all of those things say, I think you can very confidently localize disease to the elbow. I don't think you can use your exam to say definitively which one it is. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if you have pain when you're pressing across the transcondylar axis, then, you know, maybe it's more likely to be a humeral intercondylar fissure, maybe. Yeah. Um, but maybe it's also medial epicondylitis because you're pressing over the medial epicondyle. You know, it, it's all of these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Think, yeah. absolutely. But just looking at the, the caseload that I would see as a first opinion practitioner, it is very likely I would struggle to get owners to do a CT, especially mm -hmm. if they're not insured because that, that's huge. So say that this uh, Rottweiler is not insured and um, I think it was nine months old, wasn't it? And the vet has talked to her through the predisposition. She's localized that there is pain in both elbows and there's a reduced range of motion and there's a bit of a joint effusion in both. But the dog is happy. Mm -hmm. The dog is still very mobile. Now let's fill that ravine of well, what do you do? <laughs> You know, you, we're certainly not surgical. We've still got a good range of motion. We only subtly lay them intermittently. What kind of things are you talking about then? Well, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you say we're certainly not surgical. And yet there will be people that will say, well, actually, earlier treatment is better. If there's an offending bone fragment in that joint, then getting that bone fragment out potentially gives this dog a better prognosis in terms of reducing ongoing damage. And that's something that is often said. We do not have the evidence to back that up at all, <laughs> but it is something that's often said. So, I mean, it certainly, it, it, you know, without the diagnostics, you couldn't really advocate for going into the joint to have a look. But um, I don't think surgery would be out of the question for these cases. But again, it depends what they want this dog to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're kind of saying, well we're not going to go down the surgery route right now um, then I think um, options that we have obviously um, first thing is going to be trying not to make things any worse so again same thing as with the hip dysplasia cases make sure the dog's an appropriate weight a lot of rock filers are carrying a few extra pounds so um, getting getting that extra weight off reducing the systemic inflammation of that patient will almost certainly help um, looking at activity levels um, we know that dogs with poor limb lameness um, do redistribute their weight quite substantially so if it's a unique if it's one forelimb that's affected they shift their weight back onto the opposite hind limb and onto the opposite forelimb if it's both then they shift all their weight back um, and so trying to compensate for that give them some physical rehabilitation encouraging appropriate weight distribution otherwise the next thing you're going to have is a dog that's standing like with its back all arched and it's going to get a whole load of muscle pain down its back because it's now standing a different way to take weight off of the elbows mm. um, so it's certainly those kind of things I think rehab can be very important it'll maintain the range of motion that you have it won't regain something most likely but it will probably maintain what you have um, icing after activity um, then certainly can reduce your inflammation levels um, massage therapy because they are going to be talking some of their limbs in a, in a slightly abnormal way a lot of dogs with elbow disease will turn their limbs out um, and end up loading everything a little differently so again encouraging normal and uh, compensating for those muscular um, compensations when, when we're seeing them um, so that's those are all things I think we can we can think about um, Analgesics, yes. Um, I think something that I've definitely adapted my view on with elbow cases is I used to do very, very strict rest for these for kind of six weeks with pain relief. And then I would say, okay, gradually get the dog back to normal activity. Um, and then um, and come come back to me if it's lame when you get back to normal activity, because now we need to um, potentially uh, consider surgery. Now, I'm not sure that really strict activity restriction, I'm, I'm getting a little bit torn about that. I'm not sure it's right because I think all of these dogs will improve if you really, really strictly restrict them. Um, but it's not really telling you anything until you actually start getting them back to normal activity. You don't really know much at that point. So I'm a little torn as to whether that's the right thing to do. <laughs> um, I'm kind of adapting my view on a little bit, but I certainly think that 
we can't rule out that the dogs um, a surgical candidate until we've got them back to normal levels of activity with those modifications that are appropriate for elbow disease. So um, yeah. not jumping down from things, avoiding going down steps and slopes as much as possible. Um, you know, making sure that they're going down steps in a controlled fashion, if they can, not the kind of typical dog all the way down. Yeah. Uh, putting you know avoiding slipping at the bottom of stairs that's a really big thing for dogs with elbow conditions come down the stairs and then slide all the way across on a slippery floor or a mat that's at yeah. the bottom um so I think things like that and I think I think people get frustrated because all of what you've just said isn't sexy so <laughs> just diagnosed a lifelong disease in this owner's dog and they're obviously devastated and they want to do something amazing to stop the course of future. You know, they want, they want to get in there, down and dirty, obstruct the disease progression. And when you say weight, lifestyle, they're like, that's not very sexy. So let's <laughs> jump into the land of sexy, which is all the intra articulars that are being talked about a lot now. Where are we at with with that affecting, you know, because the elbows, as you say, are a very complex joint and it's therefore one of the joints that people are focusing an intra-articular approach because options are less available. Where are we at with that information, you know? I think the problem is with that is that we really, again, the evidence is, is lacking. Um, there have been some a few studies done. They're not very high level evidence. The studies that have been done, uh, the outcome measures that have been used to assess whether these animals are improving um, are not you know, objective outcome measures. So there's a limit, there's a, certainly a potential for bias in, in the interpretation of those. Um, and I think the thing is that when you talk about intra-articular therapies, no one's talking about the same thing. Even when someone says platelet-rich plasma, each company is producing that differently and it has a different like proportion of all the different stuff in it. So mm -hmm. we're not even comparing like with like when we're doing these studies a lot of the time. Um, and when you talk about stem cells, that's even more the discrepancy is even more. So um, how are they prepared? How are they harvested? All of these things are going to affect, um, you know, the, the what product we're actually using. So for me, this is a little bit similar to the nutraceuticals argument for me in, the, in that to me, the evidence isn't there yet. And so this is not something that I actually do at all. Um, so I'm, you know, very, very evidence based. And that's that's kind of how I do the vast majority of my practice. And I'm not saying everyone has to be that way or that that's the right way to be. It's just that is who I am. It's how I justify what I do. So if there's no evidence behind it, I don't tend to recommend it. Um, if an owner desperately wants to go ahead with that and try it again, um, is it going to do any harm? I don't think we know that yet either. With the nutraceuticals, we've been using them for a long time um, and we have not seen any ill effects. And there's been a lot of studies on them, long term studies um, that have not shown any ill effect. So I think we can be quite confident that nutraceuticals don't do any harm. I'm not sure we know the same with stem cells. I'm not sure we know the same with platelet rich plasma. Um, and we're also not talking now about giving a pill. We're talking about a sedation. We're talking about an intra-articular injection. Yes, the risk of infection is low, but it is still there. Um, there and so, the, you know, I'm just a little bit dubious about it. It's, I'm hopeful that the right studies will be done and that the evidence will come. And once the evidence is there, hopefully it's supportive and I will jump on board. But until then, um, I'm not jumping on board that particular treatment option myself. Right. And what about the other one that's coming into the, the, the mainstream is the extracorporeal shockwave therapy? Mm -hmm. Because that is definitely marketed and the science, the theoretical science behind it is influencing inflammatory state and disease modifying. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. anything in there? I, I mean, I think that's something that, um, you know, a little bit, again, the the ill effect of that is is less. So I'd be more inclined to say, you know, that, I, that we've, we've got some evidence to go on there. Um, if also, I think when you refer back to the to the human literature here, if you talk to a lot of the orthopedic surgeons, um, particularly the ones that are practicing at universities, high caliber institutions, they are very dismissive of platelet rich plasma and stem cell therapy. This is not something that they're agreeing with at all. You don't see the same derogatory comments, if you like, about the shockwave therapy. So, mm. I, you know, I, I kind of like to go, they've got an evidence base that we don't have yet. Is it appropriate to extrapolate it across 100%? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, but 
it's I think when you're looking at the kind of the effects of laser, the effects of shockwave therapy, those kind of things, when you're thinking about the effect it has on the blood supply, the effect of, you can probably presume that a lot of that is similar in in our patients, um, and so I don't have the same kind of. <laughs> I'm not anti uh, that at all. Again, I just, I really would like to see the right studies being done. And don't get me wrong, I know they are very difficult studies to do and that they need funding and that arthritis is intrinsically very difficult to look at because it is so variable over time between patients, within patients. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing the work. Um, and, you know, I, the thing is, we've been having these conversations, I've been having these conversations with you for at least probably eight years now. Um, we've been having the same conversations about nutraceuticals. We're having the same conversations uh, for at least the last five or six years about platelet-rich plasma. And we're just not seeing the evidence come out. And I think that's what I find disappointing is that if we're going to be prescribing these and the people that are prescribing these on a regular basis, do the work mm -hmm. and actually prove that what you're doing is effective. Because then if it really is, that's how we're going to benefit this population of dogs and cats is, is by actually proving that what we're doing is effective. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got one more thing that I want to do. Um, we could have talked about all other things like patella luxation, OCD, et cetera. <laughs> but I think one that's really relevant and very pertinent to your role, post-surgery. So let's do a case. We've got a spaniel and intercontinental <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of kind of come on pretty suddenly you know they really didn't see this coming acutely lame now and you come in you do your ct diagnose a fissure put your intercondylar screw through where are we at with the advice after that because it can be very easy for an orthopedic surgeon to say job it done and i fixed it yeah What's the thoughts here well, well i think Human intracondylar fissure is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a bit of a unique condition when we're talking about that, isn't it? Because um, unlike the medial coronoid diseases, the osteochondrosis of the elbow, the ununited ankle process of the elbow, um, these um, humeral intracondylar fissures generally come in with no evidence of osteoarthritis. So the radiograph is clean. Um, and so if, and we said that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing there, there is a fissure in the cartilage. And so you have to presume that there's something going on in the joint, mm -hmm. but these joints generally look radiographically and on CT really very clean. And so I think this is where people have just kind of said, well, I've put the screw across and we know that this fissure is very unlikely to heal. Um, it, it's no matter what we do to it. And there's not a study out there really that shows that any of these things produce healing of the entire fissure. Um, again, one of these, when you've got multiple systems aiming to do the same thing, it's probably because not one of them does the whole job entirely. <laughs> um, so I, I think those cases um, put the screw across to control the fissure um, and then we let the dog go back to relatively normal is because we don't really have evidence that anything else is justified at that point. Um, I think the whole debate is, you know, the interesting with that condition is if you've got a fissure and the dog isn't late, Mm. what do you do with that one like that's, that's that's something that I think if you polled polled the audience of 100 surgeons you'd probably get a close to a 50 50 split as to yeah. whether people put a screw in or not um and I think that's a re that's a really interesting thing but it is interesting that this condition does not seem to produce the same arthritic changes that all of the other elbow dysplasia conditions do that the elbow seems to be very forgiving of this particular pathology in a way that it is completely intolerant of pathology in any other place. So it's just yet one more thing about that condition that we don't understand. No, it's really, okay. I just keep thinking of Noel Fitzpatrick's bottom theory, you know, the whole kind of the, the <laughs> when you've got the, um, the saddle and the bottom, isn't it? Do you remember him? Yeah. And you would have thought that if you've got a slight discrepancy because of the fissure that you would have pressure points. So theoretically, you would have thought you'd have a similar degradative process, wouldn't you? Right. But, but it's interesting because, I mean, and I think this is our whole kind of understanding of the pathophysiology of this condition has changed over time, right? Because we used to think this was a, a growth plate that didn't fuse. Um, and that made zero sense because if you've had micro motion going on for four years, because these dogs tend to fracture or start coming in with lameness at about like age four or five um if that's really been micro motion that entire time why is this joint so clean yeah. um, and so it makes much more sense now that we're saying that at, at least in the spaniels this is more likely to be a kind of stress fracture and it's actually not been there the entire time it's it's come along later um and that makes a lot more sense 
Um, so I think in, in that situation, a lot of the time the cartilage is actually intact over the over the fissure um, if you scope them. Um, and so, you know, unless you're actually really getting to the point of it's almost fractured, but if you pick them up when they're just fissures, the cartilage can often be intact over the top. And I think that's why the joint seems to be preserved. So the stress fracture theory works a lot better than this growth plate that didn't fuse um, because then yeah it makes no sense to me how a four-year-old dog could have had a micro motion going on for four years and have no intra-articular right. change exactly okay so let's go for the one that's much more obvious then you've got a a, a young dog it's going to be uh let's do a stuffed shibble theory i don't know why but and <laughs> um actually believe it or not it's had a traumatic cruciate injury it's got its okay. foot caught in a rabbit hole which is really against the grain mm -hmm. but i just want to do a post-surgical um hammer home it doesn't stop there so what would be the advice that you would give having done it's a full cruciate tear um and you've done a tplo well, the interesting thing there is I wouldn't do a TPLO until the dog was skeletally mature anyway. So you might end up managing this patient conservatively for a period of time until its growth plates are closed. Um, because I personally wouldn't do one while the tibial tube rostral physis is open. I certainly wouldn't do one while the proximal tibial physis is open. So it depends what age they did. Let's go, let's go for 22 months. Okay, well, 22 <laughs> months then, TPLO, fine. <laughs> I was going to say, how, how immature are we talking? Um, okay, so yeah, so um, if they're, if, as long as their growth plates are closed, then yeah, TPLO, absolutely. Um, now, I, I think the interesting thing here is when, when you chat to a lot of people about um, rehab following TPLOs, and particularly if you talk to physical rehabilitationists who have rehabilitated patients following TPLO, um, they find it very unrewarding because these dogs do well anyway. <laughs> so it's hard to make a difference in terms of that eight week TPLO recovery because they tend to be putting if the, the TPLO is done appropriately and they haven't developed an infection or a late meniscal tear or anything like that. These dogs are putting weight on the leg within a couple of days and they have a very consistent um, recovery period with most of them being barely lame by three or four weeks postoperatively. So, I mean, this is uh, something that, um, you know, because the dog looks like it's doing great, it's very easy to ignore the fact that that arthritis is still on going that the uh, that disease process is still progressive within the joints um, because we look at the dog from the outside and we go well, he looks great yeah. perfect sign him off come back if there's ever a problem and most of them don't come back um, at least not to us now I suspect they are going back to their local vets um, and I actually had one vet on the phone um, just last week um, saying that they had it was a sepatia bull terrier um, we've done bilateral TPLOs when the dog was quite young um, and now they were, she was saying, well, the dog's hyperextending its hocks and is there something wrong in the hock? Can I get a brace um, for the dog's hock? And I was like, your dog's problem is not the hock. 99.999%. This dog has prolific stifle osteoarthritis and is shifting its weight forwards, which is resulting in the hyperextension of the hock. Your hock brace is not going to help you. No. It's the stifle arthritis. Um, and so that's the thing. And I think we, we are very, because they do well clinically, I think the vast majority of TPLO patients do not have any ongoing therapy for their osteoarthritis, even though we know it is there. Mm. Um, so I think certainly giving advice to owners, and we always say arthritis will progress with time. So what can we do? We can certainly still advise um, avoiding very high impact activity. Um, we can still advise um, very much monitoring of the patient. Um, and I think monitoring is key. Um, if the muscling doesn't get back to normal, then rehab, absolutely. If the muscling ever starts to die off, rehab, absolutely. If you start seeing that hyperextension of the hocks, um, then certainly that's a bad sign, right? We've gone, that's that's well established um, arthritis and problem once you've got that weight shifting. So um, certainly that's something that, you know, rehab in those kind of, as a kind of chronic process, I think can be helpful for these guys. Mm -hmm. um, do they need to be on, um, you know, weight, weight control continually? We've said it for every single condition, like these dogs need to have good weight control um, and they need to be on the skinny side. They already have orthopedic disease, we know that keep them as a four out of nine on the body condition score, not a five, a four, let's keep, keep them down there. Um, and, and again, then you get onto the debates of dietary management. You get onto the debates of, you know, is a joint specific diet going to make a difference? Is um, a nutraceutical going to make a difference? And again, that's personal preference. It's not something I'd be saying to go with, but it's, it's something that people might want to do if they want to be doing absolutely everything. Um, in terms of medications, I don't tend to keep them on medications long term and as long as they're exercising and everything well, but 
I think what we're missing a lot of the time with these cases is, is the monitoring process. And I think because the TPLO is done by a specialist surgeon a lot of the time, and then they're going back to the, the practitioner, um, it's, it's, we need to be doing something a little bit more objective on those wellness visits. Every time the dog comes in, we need to be doing something a little bit more objective and comparing it to the previous year because owners really struggle to see a very gradual deterioration in their pet. They see the pet every day. If something's just gradually, gradually, gradually changing, it's hard for them to see. We see them every year. If we're using the same kind of assessment every year, we should be able to see if something's trending in the wrong direction. And, and I think that's something that we miss a lot of the time. And that's not a critique because I have very long appointments. And if I run over time, no one's really that bothered by it. Um, I'm not running 10 to 15 minute appointments. Mm. So very easy for me to say, but you know, maybe if you know someone coming in for a wellness exam, send them the questionnaire to do by email beforehand. Yeah. Um, and then they, you can have the result ready for the appointment itself. You know, it takes organization, but I'd really like to see that becoming a bit more of a standard. We've got the questionnaire for the cats, which has come out, which is literally just six questions easily can be done in a consultation. Um, we, we've got like all, a ton of validated questionnaires for kind of evaluating um, dog mobility. Yeah. So just using one of them, sticking to one and just saying, we're going to use this one every year. Um, and at least then you can pinpoint if something's going wrong and then either you manage it yourself or send it to someone who's absolutely because I think as you say it's always it's always a bit distressing being the first opinion vet where you have a dog come in you palpate the stifle let's use the stifle as an example and it's grossly remodeled there's a real lack of range of motion you can feel the femur through the musculature and they say yeah yeah I had, um, I had um, cruciate surgery four years ago and you're like Mm. we could have we could have done more for this we really could have done more for this and in my mind you know trying to get people to maybe have a physio assessment every six months to a year picking up on the loss of range of motion the muscle mass loss and just keeping people on point with the weight control with the exercise management with doing targeted exercises would be lovely rather than I think a lot of people get through the surgery and go just done yeah I'm good now isn't it Absolutely. And, and I think I think you know, that's key. And a lot of that falls on us as, as, as surgeons as well is owner education and like making sure someone knows what the expected projection is. What should my dog look like at this point, this point, this point and this point? Like, mm -hmm. is this normal or is this a problem? And I think something that for me um, is, is a little bit concerning in the recent literature is there's a, is there's a kind of trend developing saying, well, you know, we don't need to do eight week follow ups on TPLOs because in 96% of the time it doesn't change what you do. And then there's a similar paper coming out for patella luxation surgery that says the same thing, that it very rarely changes what you're going to do. I'm like, I completely agree. The vast majority of my follow up appointments are completely boring <laughs> and the dog's doing great and the x-ray looks great. But does that mean we're just going to ignore that 4% of patients that had a problem? Yeah, but you're also you're leaving the door open and you're creating a relationship with that owner that they know that they can come back to you. Right. I think we forget that that vet client patient relationship is so important. And if you, the orthopedic surgeon, hasn't said that eight week, hello, how are you doing? The doors are starting to shut and people don't feel that they can go back and ask you things. Absolutely. And I think it's great research to do. I mean, we can we can be very honest with owners now when they say, well, I, you know, I can't really afford the 300 pounds to have my follow up. Uh, radiographs done what's the likelihood it's going to be a problem and you can say well if I do an orthopedic exam and actually it's very unlikely we're going to see something if we've got the exam is normal it's very unlikely the radiographs are going to show anything so you know this this is the kind of gamble that you're playing with here these are the numbers we can we can tell you and um and I think that's fine I think giving the owner the option and and making sure that again we're not charging someone for something that they can't afford which is very unlikely to make a difference I'm on board with that I'm just worried it's going to turn into we don't see these cases at all um, yeah. And I think that's like you say, it's the relationship that's gone and it might be a small percentage of dogs that we miss, but that is that small percentage. Kill someone's dog. Important. Yeah. <laughs> Kill someone's dog. I love it. OK, well, I think we've covered a hell of a lot. We completely went away from my um, <laughs> my agenda. I love it. It works perfectly. <laughs> I write them and then I don't do them. But, um, no, I think we've covered a huge amount. It's sad that it hasn't been live because I know that we would have a huge amount of questions. And I'll go through the questions that probably were posed and see what I can do with them later. I'll get this um, put up tonight yes. so that it still goes out. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to say thank you 
because you're wonderful. You give up so much time to help, help Cam. So Karen is one of the Cam advisors. We now have 20. <laughs> We've had a, a few recent additions. We've had Cameron Black join us. I don't know Cameron Black. I know the name. I, I'm not sure we've met in person, but I know the name. You, your past kind of must have crossed at Fitzpatrick, kind of. I think you probably mm. just a few years out. So he's um, joining us to help us with the biologicals, the interarticular, staying ahead of the game, non-biased. There's no fingers and pies, no vested interest, which is fab. And then we've got Julia Robertson, who is founder of Gala Myotherapy, coming to talk more about muscle, you know, fascia, soft tissue management, which is really good. So the CAM advisory team is continuing to grow. And we thank you so much for the time that you give us. Yeah. I'll try and keep an eye on the questions as well and uh, answer any that. Uh, yeah, perfect. Because there is so much that people want to know. Because as as we're learning more about the condition, more and more questions. Because there's more and more people marketing. There's a lot more marketing going on. I have my eye on the prize, and there is a lot of Facebook ads about this disease now. <laughs> try to steer people clear from things that haven't got so much evidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Karen, and we'll see you next time. Bye.